kill me. I'm not gonna kill you. You're gonna kill me. Hey, Tony, what'd you take? Oh. 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 Hey, he's, he took some. I'll make sure you're still breathing. Yeah. It's <laughs> his nose buried in there. I think he's just. Tony. Tony. Hey. Hey. Back to school. Wake up. I don't want to go to school. We bought your new shoes for the first day of school. Come on. <laughs> made breakfast, scrambled eggs, your favorite. <laughs> Went waffles. Uh, he didn't just die down there, did he? Hope I didn't kill him. But you did kill him. A lot of laughing before they killed him. Now, door number one to court was closed when, even despite that video, prosecutors dismissed what were even minor charges against the officers. Door number two, in that case, slammed shut for this police immunity. It was the same for David Cauley, who was walking away from Texas police when they shot him paralyzing him from the waist down in an incident caught on dash cam video. Collie's case never got to trial either because the judges granted police immunity. Now, he says it's unfair that the system didn't even let him make his case to a jury, considering he is innocent, and the police put him in, quote, a nursing home, ruining everything, saddling him with pain and costs he can't afford while they won't even admit the mistake. What keep me moving forward is the fact that I'm still alive. They paint a, a dirty pitch. That's, that's not the truth. Let's just acknowledge the fact that we made a mistake. And, I'm, I, and you know, for me, I can, I can move forward. I can accept it. These incidents of police causing lifelong injuries do make a very strong case for legal compensation. But courts apply that immunity shield just the same. There's another case of Texas police paralyzing a man they shot, Ricardo Salazar. Judges blocking his day in court the same way. Now, he appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, which refused to even order a basic trial to find the facts. Instead, Justice Alito writing an opinion that defended this broad automatic police immunity that I'm telling you about. Now, in dissent, Justice Sotomayor and the late RBG did question how the immunity has become an absolute shield for officers that eliminates accountability. Sotomayor has actually written several dissents warning about this immunity, noting that when police are shielded from any fact finding or trials, then the government takes the word of one party over another. She calls it a, quote, disturbing trend where courts blindly side with officers before getting the facts. She notes it also fosters a climate of no consequences where more officers shoot first and think later. And that does capture the approach of some officers who attend trainings that often encourage a warrior mentality with no legal consequences. Let me show you a working police trainer who tells trainees, quote, Killing's not a big deal. And I'm showing this to you right now because it's actually true that with this police immunity, many judges do treat it like it's not a big deal. Killing is just not that big a deal. For a mature warrior who's killing somebody represents a clear and present danger to others, it's just not that big a deal. Are you emotionally, spiritually, psychologically prepared to snuff out a human life in defense of innocent lives. If you can't make that decision, you need to find another job. The officer who shot Philando Castile to death attended trainings by that instructor. That officer was acquitted at one of those rare criminal trials I mentioned. So that's how this works. Where did it come from? This is also important. Police immunity is made up. Let me repeat that tonight. Police immunity in American civil courtrooms is made up. This is not in the Constitution. It's not in a written federal law. It grew out of a series of cases where courts were trying to limit how much people could use what I'm telling you about, door number two, to sue government officials. It began back with a 1960s lawsuit by civil rights advocates and priests who were challenging segregation. They were arrested for allegedly breaching the peace. You can see all the pastors there. The charges, though, were thrown out, so they sued the police. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, which found that even though the arrest was wrong, that all those priests you see shouldn't have been charged, the suit would still be tossed without a trial. Otherwise, a policeman's lot would be so unhappy they'd be hit with financial damages for an honest mistake in an arrest. Later cases involving Nixon aides and police fortified this immunity to shield officials from liability in most cases. So unelected judges made up this rule, and the Supreme Court has been doubling down on it in the majority opinion, shielding police from that day in court 
that I told you about that so many Americans imagine is a part of our system where you tell your side of the story and you face judgment or vindication by a jury of your peers. So when you take some of the real people hurt or killed in each story that I reported tonight, consider how this works. I'm not here telling you that we know they were all correct or the police who hurt them were all wrong or that we have the whole story. That's what fact-finding in a trial is for. What I'm telling you, what I'm urging you through the TV screen to understand is that this police immunity rule means we never get those facts about what happened. We never get the public trial about what they did, paralyzed or dead, because unelected judges prevent those trials because they toss these cases before the fact-finding that happens in virtually every other non-police type of case. That's unfair to the people who were hurt or killed. And it also risks more violence and more police misconduct in this problem that we have as a nation that we're trying to deal with. Because as any officer will tell you, real consequences create deterrence. And when there are no consequences, some people, not all, not all officers, but some people in an environment with zero consequences, well, some people will do the right thing. Others, not all, but others, they'll see it as a blank check. Now, since this rule was made up, it can be unmade. Congress can literally just eliminate it as civil rights leaders have advocated. The House passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which would end qualified immunity. Black Lives Matter, that must both be reflected in our policies, which is why we need to end qualified immunity. End qualified immunity. It is a broken legal doctrine that never should have been created in 1967, and it's time to abolish it now. All those references are to this immunity that I'm telling you about, technically called a qualified immunity. Now, there are bills in Congress on all kinds of issues that they claim to do something in the title and then they dilute it in the fine print. They are politicians. This time, though, I can report House Democrats did abolish this immunity in the George Floyd Act. Speaker Pelosi passing that act within a month of inauguration. It is one of the most sweeping proposed reforms to policing in a generation. It will become federal law if the Senate passes it. But Republicans, they want to strip that immunity reform out of this bill. We cannot be so eager to make major policing reforms on the federal level that we overcorrect and prevent good officers on the street from being able to do their job. Qualified immunity is extremely important. Imagine you're thinking about becoming a police officer and you think you're going to be personally liable uh, for every fracas you try to uh, break up. Qualified immunity is off the table. They see that as a poison bill on our side. Republicans say it's off the table, which is another sign that it is a major change. Republicans more focused on stopping immunity reform than any other part of the bill. And one so-called compromise would still basically protect officers' individual immunity. But what would happen if this immunity ended and door number two was cracked open? We actually have part of the answer for you. Take the recent controversial Colorado police incident where an unarmed woman and children were handcuffed, held at gunpoint, put on the floor in the broad daylight parking lot. <laughs> Police admitted that was wrong. It was a mistaken identity. It was mistreatment. They apologized. Door number one still quickly shut. No charges. But door number two is now open this time because Colorado is one of just four states that have now reformed police immunity at the state level. So the mother, who you saw there, sued police in civil court, alleging mistreatment and discrimination. I'm not even here to tell you how that case should end. They have to gather the facts and the testimony and the context. I'm here to tell you tonight, the only reason she even gets her day in court is because she lives in one of the few places in our whole country that's finally, slightly challenging 
this longstanding automatic police immunity where there's no trials. So there, they could get a trial. It was actually the first suit filed against police since Colorado made this reform. If you watch the beat, you may remember we reported on that with the lawyer when the news first broke. So that is tangibly the difference. It doesn't hobble or kneecap police from doing their whole jobs. It just means in that place, the police who are already cleared and have no risk of prison time might actually face a public trial over what they did that day. So where do we go from here? American policing is often simplified into a pretty false choice between what's good for police or what's good for people being policed. And you can come up with some examples that might sort of fit into that frame. But many don't. Fair, accountable policing is generally good for everyone. And if no one's above the law, that's got to especially include the powerful, the politicians who write these laws and the police who enforce them with guns. So I want to tell you this because the jargon and the terms and the heated rhetoric, it can occlude what we're actually living through and why some of these things are things we can improve and fix and address if we want to. The basic right to your day in court and trial is not some benefit to be given out by unelected judges to Americans or to Americans hurt by police. Or as you saw here, the diverse range of people hurt by police. I showed you multiple stories, but statistically, it's not something to be given out to black Americans disproportionately hurt by police. It is your constitutional right. It's a right everyone should have. It is a right that, as you saw tonight was taken away by unelected judges and which can really be restored any time our nation decides to do so. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.